What's up, everybody? Eric here. I'm excited today. I've got a special guest, and this is going to be a great interview. I have the president and CEO of Skywater Technology, Thomas Sonderman. Thomas, how are you doing today? Doing great. How are you? I'm doing excellent. I've been researching your company for the last couple of weeks, getting ready for this, this interview. I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. I'm an investor in the company, and I really want to bring awareness to more people. You're a smaller company. Yep. I think this will be helpful for potential investors to understand Skywater Technology. So if you could start, right. maybe just give us a high-level overview of your background experience. I looked on LinkedIn, and I can tell you it's very impressive, uh, your resume and your experience. But if you could just share that with the audience, I think it'd be a good start. Yeah, great. And it really ties into Skywater. Uh, so, you know, I began my career back at Advanced Micro Devices, AMD. Yep. Uh, we were competing against Intel. We were an IDM, integrated device manufacturer. So we had our own fabs. Uh, I was in the manufacturing uh, side. So I began my life in this industry uh, in the fab and uh, spent literally the next couple of decades competing with Intel, really uh, learning the importance of thinking differently uh, when you're going up against much bigger competitors. And yep. that really uh, was important and is important today for Skywater uh, and how we're bringing kind of a, a new way of thinking to a very crowded uh, semiconductor foundry um, you know, business. And then in 2009, we spun out our manufacturing operations at AMD and created Global Foundries. And so I was part of the team that uh, led that spin out effort. I uh, learned a lot about how you go from being an IDM, integrated device manufacturer, essentially designing and manufacturing your own products uh, to becoming a service provider, uh, which is what Global Foundries is. The next stage uh, for me was to move into the equipment industry. I actually got to kind of go on the other side and see what it was like to uh, sell equipment and software to uh, fabs. And I spent a lot of time in Asia uh, over over those, you know, call it five to six years where I really was, you know, seeing one that all the all the investment, everything was moving to moving to Asia. And right. also there was this lack of innovation going on. It was more just like cookie cutter. Uh, how many more smartphones can we make? How many more of this can we make? But uh, innovation was lacking. And then uh, in 2017, Cypress Semiconductor decided to spin off their fab here in Minnesota, a fab that not only was a leading edge 200 millimeter fab, but also one that had embedded innovation, thus created Skywater. And uh, we haven't looked back since. That's excellent. So 11 years, I think, AMD and four years Global Foundries plus plenty of other experience. So that's, that's very impressive. And if you could, we don't need to go into technology into too much detail in the beginning here. I've got questions later that will break down different technologies that you guys deal with. But if you could just discuss the company's core mission and services just from a real high level. Yeah. So, you know, we are a service provider. We do not make our own products. So we are a pure play semiconductor manufacturer. Uh, we engage with companies not only for high volume manufacturing, what I would call a traditional foundry, but we also do what we call embedded R&D inside our high volume manufacturing operation. And that's what gives us our unique capability. So I mentioned IDM. Uh, Intel today is an IDM, integrated device manufacturer. Right. Uh, there's there's only a handful of those left. So we're creating is what I call a virtual IDM like effect, where if you're a fabulous company, you can actually come to Skywater while you're developing your product, and we will develop the process that that product will be manufactured on with you, uh, and do it in a way where customers can get a lot of differentiation. They can customize uh, and really create a unique offering, uh, and then we become the sole source manufacturer for that technology when it ramps to production. Perfect. So we kind of you talked about this already, but basically the company was formed. Skywater Technology was formed in 2017, uh, acquired Cypress Foundry Solutions, and you guys went public, I believe, in April of 2021. Is that right? Yeah. So in 2017, Cypress Semiconductor spun out the Fab uh, that we have here in Bloomington, Minnesota, and uh, private equity investor Oxbow Industry came in and acquired the Fab, and then we were private up until April of 2021 when we did our IPO. 
Excellent. And then we've been a public company since then on the NASDAQ, SKYT, by the way. SKYT, right now about a $555 million market cap with lots of room to grow. And we're going to talk Absolutely. about that here. So Fired Up Wealth here, we call semiconductors the new oil. You know, semiconductors fuel all those secular growth trends, those mega trends. If you're listening to this, you probably heard me say it many, many times. When you think of Internet of Things, you think of autonomous, you think of artificial intelligence, AI, big buzzword right now, but definitely growing lots of opportunity there. And even everyday items. You know, this microphone I'm talking to you on, this computer, the phone in my hand, the new refrigerator you buy, or even a microwave or dishwasher. I mean, everything, electronics in general, but especially those secular growth trends as an investor, you're trying to, to look for companies that can benefit. We call them pick and shovel type plays and semiconductors are pick and shovel and really the new oil. And I think we share the same view on this. President Biden last year, he held up a wafer. I think it was a Skywater wafer. It was a Skywater mistaken. wafer. Yep, and absolutely. he said it was at a press conference last year talking about the CHIPS Act and everything. And he said, this is infrastructure when he held up your wafer. Could you maybe add some color to this and share your thoughts, what he means by this is infrastructure? Yeah, great question. And it's true. I mean, think of the amount of electronics that each of us interact with every day. Uh, it's literally foundational to the way we you know, lead our lives, much like fuel, the way we get to work and all that is petroleum today, right? Uh, and we're moving to EV. EV requires a lot of electronics. The idea is that we're really in an information technology era. That era is fueled by uh, semiconductors and electronics. And one of the things that is happening is really, if you go back to you know the late 80s, the 90s, and then here we are in 2023, what we've been doing is building this vast infrastructure, communication infrastructure, truly uh, connecting everything. So we start out with, you know, our, our desktops and we went to laptops and then we went to smartphones and then in, in the background, we're building this enormous cloud, which is, you know, a bunch of servers sitting all over the world. Uh, and then very sophisticated ways to move that information around without having to plug in. Right. And now that, that infrastructure is there. And the fourth wave of computation, which we're in right now, is all about connecting everything to everything and personalizing that experience. And that's what's so exciting is the U.S. is now reinvesting in this technology at a time when we're entering this this next wave. And it's all going to be about innovation. And that's why Skywater exists. That's why all of us are so excited that we've kind of all woken up to this reality that this is something that's not only vital to national security, but economic security and really the way we live our life. Yeah, absolutely. And it's fun hearing you say that because I, I talk about this stuff all the time and I'm sure people listening, hearing it from you, from a president and CEO of a semiconductor fa you know, fab, it's powerful. And we definitely share the same view on that. And that was kind of a good segue into my next question. You know, the U.S. government has determined domestic semiconductor supply is a top priority. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You think of uh, Taiwan, 65 percent of semiconductors are manufactured and 90 percent of the advanced chips you know, and there's geopolitical risks. We don't need to go into that in too much detail. But the passage of the CHIPS Act last summer is really proving that we want to invest in bringing that technology, the production of manu you know, manufacturing back to U.S. soil. And I was going to ask you specifically why you think this is. You kind of alluded to it mm -hmm. in that last question or response, but also how Skywater will benefit, say, over the next five years. Like, we'd love to understand the role that Skywater plays when you think of each aspect of the bill. So for example, pure manufacturing capacity versus development versus advanced packaging. And that'll segue into some other questions here later, not to mention strategic government programs. How does that, how does your company fit into all that? Yeah, another great question. And, you know, one of the things that I like to say is Skywater is unique because we really address all elements of what CHIPS is all about. So, you know, first and foremost, it is about innovation. Uh, innovation, we call it strategic or synergistic innovation, uh, is the foundation of, you know, what makes our country great. I'm, we go back to, you know, the founding of the semiconductor industry, it began. And, you know, in Silicon Valley, it began here in Minnesota. Uh, it, it all began here in the U.S. And when you couple that with this kind of, I would call it evolution of the manufacturing component away from the United States, that's kind of what happened. We still design a lot of technologies here where, you know, software, we're, we're innovating uh, all over the place, but the core manufacturing capability uh, was outsourced. And there was a lot of, you know, reasons why that made sense at the time. But as we just discussed, uh, electronics are becoming so 
foundational to our way of life. It is part of national security. It is part of economic security. And one of the things that happened with COVID, when we saw the supply chain disruptions, we saw the impact on individuals, on countries, on companies, uh, when you didn't have control of that supply chain. And so I think what you're going to see happening is not only are we moving into this next wave of competition or computation, but we're also going to bring back that supply chain. And that's where you get into the second component, which is really the manufacturing scale. We want to not only innovate here in the U.S., but we want to be able to manufacture, secure manufacturing, and not just fabricate the wafers, but fabricate down to the singulated die that goes in a package that goes in a printed circuit board that goes into a system. Uh, We have to have complete control of that very complicated value chain. And I think there's a lot of language about advanced packaging or heterogeneous integration in the bill. Uh, That's all about singulating wafers, putting them in packages, reconstituting them, doing more fabrication and putting them again into uh, new packages. And all that expertise has kind of moved to Asia, uh, primarily Taiwan and China. And as a result, that needs to come back. And I think what's exciting, uh, and both of those elements, of course, play right with Skywater, is that to to make all that work, you've got to have a workforce that is capable of running these fabs. Uh, You've got to make manufacturing sexy again, frankly. You've got to get people excited about wanting to make careers of, of manufacturing like I've made it a career myself. And so those three elements are our foundational and Skywater is actively involved. Our fab uh, that we announced in partnership with Purdue is all about that, is putting uh, a fab right on the campus of a place that's producing a lot of uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturing, semiconductor students that can then work in that, drive that innovation, and then have that secure manufacturing on the other side. The, the last element uh, that sometimes gets overlooked is the investment tax credit. And that investment tax credit is um, really important for companies like Skywater that have a fab, a 200 millimeter fab. We can modernize this fab, adding new equipment, more sophisticated equipment more automation, significantly uh, get more output, get more innovation uh, without having to put a shovel on the ground. And that particular element uh, benefits us as well. So really the the four elements, uh, which is the 39 billion for new fab construction, the 11 billion for, you know, I would just call it the the buildup of the innovation ecosystem within the country uh, through these innovation labs, and then the investment tax credit, those are all things we're going to benefit from. And then finally, there's a very unique one that also gets overlooked, which is the $2 billion tied directly to the Department of Defense for secure microelectronics. And that effort is also, uh, you know, directly tied to Skywater, who who does a lot of uh, engagement with the U.S. government. That's excellent. We did a 45-minute deep dive in the community on semiconductors and broke it down. And the CHIPS Act was a big piece of that because yep. it is substantial. And it's not just the U.S. I mean, you look at the EU has a, a kind of a chip, their own CHIPS Act. There's investment going on all over the world. People are, especially governments, are starting to see the importance of this and some of the risks that could happen. That's why, you know, new oil, it kind of ties back into that with geopolitics it is. too, right? Yes, yeah, so and sovereignty, you know, people want to control uh, this, you know, just like you want to have control of where you get your oil, right? Uh, in today's economy, you've got to have control of where you get your electronics. And you said it earlier, when it, it's even your refrigerator uh, or your garage, right? <laughs> garage right. door. Electronics fell in your garage door. Now your garage door doesn't <laughs> open, right? Uh, so there's, I learned that one myself. <laughs> Me too. The whole idea is that it's really pervasive. And the other thing is it's getting more involved with our health. So we do a lot of work in biomedical and the ability to have diagnostics that can't be compromised, uh, that are unique to you, uh, that allow you to feel safe that the information you're getting is valid. And also that the the feedback, the prescription you're getting in many cases from your phone is valid as well. These are all things that come very, very fundamental. And we all want that protected uh, because now you, you know, you're going to be making decisions in many ways based on electronics. When you're driving your autonomous car or semi-autonomous car, you want to know those electronics are secure. They can't be corrupted. And I think that's where you're seeing not just innovation in the U.S., but secure manufacturing. Everybody, including myself, you, will want to know where did that come from, right? Is that a secure device that can't be, um, you know, used nefariously? <laughs> yeah. uh, which, uh, you know, in, in today's world, uh, we have to all think about those things. 
Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Really good. Let's go a little deeper on Skywater, specifically technology. So walk me through your process. What does that look like from a high level? If I want to manufacture a chip, what's the process look like? I call you up. What happens from there? Yeah, another great question. Uh, the the um, thing that's unique about Skywater, we like to say it starts with your idea. We are um, all about innovation and while we do have high volume customers that download our PDKs, which are process design kits that run what you'd call a standard kind of foundry model, uh, just taking their IP, putting it on our manufacturing process and creating products, we do that. But what makes us unique is our advanced technology services component. And this is something we began to perfect back in 2008 when Cypress owned the fab. So say you're an engineer and you have an idea for, for, for a photonics device uh, but you want to also have it run with a CMOS on a CMOS platform. Uh, we have CMOS 130 nanometer, 90 nanometer, uh, moving to 65. These are things that um, we can do with you. You come in with the idea. I want to go create uh, some new device, and uh, you're, you know, obviously had an interaction with maybe someone else that didn't deliver it for you. Or you're just coming to us from the start. Uh, and what we do is we work up a series of development cycles uh, that will allow you to tune your product to our manufacturing process. And about 80%, 70-80% of the process will be the same amongst all our customers. But what we do is offer a level of customization. That's why we call ourselves a technology foundry. So that you can innovate, you can create your own unique design IP that runs on our unique manufacturing IP. And then when you get to market and now you have a product that works, you not only go through faster cycles of learning because you're developing it uh, in this unique environment, but it's more manufacturable because it's getting developed in an environment that's going to manufacture it. So now when you're ready to ramp your product, say two or three years uh, from when we start talking, now you don't have to move it to another fab. You can literally start running it in volume here at Skywater. And so it's really accelerated time to market efficient R&D. Uh, spin and the ability to differentiate your product in the market in a way that you can't using the standard foundry model. It's really interesting. So, I mean, IP is really important because you're dealing with lots of different IP, you know, so security is going to be, you know, critical for right. your business. And we could talk a lot longer about that, but it's just important to, to note. And if anybody listening and you hear Thomas say ATS, so that's advanced te technology services, they also refer to it as technology as a service. So you think of software right. as a service, SaaS, you think of training as a service, you know, that's, yep. that's also tasks with, with companies out there that do uh, like no before is a, you know, uh, it's a SaaS company that does training as a service. When you see tasks, this is technology as a service and it's referring to this ATS as advanced technology services that we're talking yep. about. Uh, so it's really interesting stuff and it's a unique model that really nobody else is, is doing. Not and right. uh, I think it makes a lot of sense when you think of the next generation of foundries and when you think of semiconductors in general, the model is very old, right? It's been around yeah. for a long time and you're, you're revolutionizing that model. And so this is a good segue to another one of your key product areas. You know, earlier, we, we discussed strategic government programs. Can you explain what rad hard means? I know what it means, but explain to the audience what it means and what you're developing that is really superior from a technology standpoint to existing platforms. And we think of RH90 development that work to date does it better position you for additional domestic semiconductor programs share some information about that yeah uh, so rad hard is radiation hardened uh, it's essentially taking a normal you know semiconductor in our case CMOS devices uh, which are very common for logic based technologies and you uh, do some special things to make it work in space uh, and in stream, extreme environment uh, situations and and that can be high heat and it can also be, you know, space where you have a lot of uh, other radiation going around. And so uh, this is strategic rad hard. So we are creating the world's most radiation hardened CMOS technology. That particular technology, of course, has a lot of, you know, applications, things you really can't talk about. <laughs> but right. there's more and more activity happening in space. Right. That's where a lot of computation is going on. Uh, that's where, you know, you think of a Starlink with the Elon Musk you know, capability up there. So uh, we, we used to move things around in wires. Right. And now we do it with cell phones, cellular towers. And now they're going to be moving it 
through satellites in space. You're just going to need a lot more capabilities in space, uh, not only to, you know, this is an ASIC platform and memory platform. So uh, it's it's essentially when a, a prime for the U.S. government wants to create a solution for the U.S. government, they will be told, go to Skywater because we have invested to create this very strategic rad hard technology and we want it manufactured there. And uh, that is that is essentially what we've been doing. And the technology uh, also has a commercial derivative uh, that we're working with Google on, where we take away all the radiation hardened pieces, but we also have a fully depleted SOI, which is the starting material uh, that has some very unique properties, and that can be just brought to the commercial market. So it's kind of a dual use where we're solving this problem for the U.S. government, uh, for, you know, for you know national security reasons, and then we're also creating a new capability. Uh, and open source, by the way, this is an open source version we're doing with Google, which is kind of a way to lower the cost to get products to market on legacy node technologies. This is awesome because if you're in our private community and you're watching this, we're doing a conference right now. And it's basically a conference talking about, you know, stock market investing, but talking about megatrends. And we literally went from semiconductors into EVs. You think of green energy then into space. And so with EVs, we're talking about how last year in 2022, only 10% of automobile sales were EVs. And it's not just EVs. I mean, even ICE vehicles in general are using more and more chips. There's huge amounts of TAM when you think of the automotive industry and you think of semiconductors. Then when you think of space, this is really in its infancy. And we're talking about Starlink and you think of like Amazon Kuiper and all these different companies that are trying to not only launch rockets, you think of SpaceX and Blue Orbit and Rocket Lab, but then there's the actual satellites that have to go up there. And you're thinking 3,000 yep. satellites or more for a constellation. That's going to require chips as well. And that's the future of the internet, connecting fiber along with towers and low you know, orbit satellites. This is the yep. future of technology. And this is what we're talking about. So if you listen to what Thomas is saying, he's saying that you know, Skywater is involved as a pick and shovel, as a foundry, you know, basically for for all of these different secular growth trends that we have just covered the last couple of weeks. So it's really, it's really <laughs> exciting to hear you say that. And it wasn't something that we discussed ahead of time. This is just natural conversation. So it's really, really good. Yeah, and this, this, this is a good, a good topic here because it's important. You know, we, we focus a lot, or you hear a lot of people focus on the advanced nanometer technology. And, you know, you think of Moore's law and that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down. But a lot of people are misinformed when you think of the 200 millimeter and where that tech has been. It's been around for a while where it's headed. A lot of people say, well, it's going away. And I don't think that's the case. And I know that you don't, but I want you to explain your thoughts because advanced node technology is really a small segment of the market. So is 200 millimeter going away or what do you see in there? Yeah, uh, great question. And I'm smiling because you're singing my song now. <laughs> So we call it the long tail, right? So by the end of this decade, 60 to 65% of semiconductors will still be made on 65 nanometer and above technologies. Uh, that That's a industry statistic. The reality is that there is demand for the advanced node. And this is the, the, the companies, I call it the top you know 1% that can afford to pay the half a billion to a billion dollars for our design that leverages a five nanometer, four nanometer, two nanometer type technology, you have to have vast amounts of volume to be able to justify that, right? So these are smartphone companies are ones that are, you know, core with the computational space. I think there's a lot, and this is really what happened. All the, the, the whole industry was spending so much money and in investing in that, that all the rest of the industry was starving for innovation. And that's kind of goes back to my original comment uh, back around the creation of Skywater. There was this huge appetite for innovation. You couldn't do it in Asia because you needed to have not only some level of volume or something of an idea to get them interested, but in many ways, you worried about the IP, right? The valuable IP that you created now it was in jeopardy. And so uh, the whole Skywater model is really to make it easier for that innovation to occur far that long tail. And frankly, 200 millimeter, uh, these, these technologies were... You can blend things together, like I said, taking a photonics application and tying it to a CMOS application or maybe integrating a MIMS application and putting it all together using wafer level vacuum packaging. These are all the future, right? It's uh, it's the, the whole idea. We're, we're not going to regain leadership in semiconductor manufacturing by repeating what's already been done in Asia. We have to think differently over here. And that's really where 
you know, and I'm glad, you know, it became part of the law, there is going to be investment in an advanced node because you have to have that because it's a critical capability for certain applications. But there's also going to be a lot of investment in other parts of the value chain. Uh, and that's where we come in. And so 200 millimeter will be here uh, for a very long time. I started my career in this industry on 200 millimeter, and I, I suspect it'll be uh, here uh, uh, for, for the rest of it. And I, I think 300 millimeter is something we don't have a lot of capability here in the U.S. I mean, other than Intel, Global Foundries has one fab, Micron, uh, TI, that's it. So, you know, having a, a kind of wave of new 300 millimeter construction will get, pay dividends, you know, for 50 years. I mean, that think of this fab. This fab was built by control data back in the late 80s, right? And here we are now, uh, you know, coming in and, we're focused on modernization, automation. This fab can last another 50 years uh, just through the right investment. And fabs don't go away. It's just what do they make, right? And uh, and I think that's the exciting part about not only a comprehensive investment strategy, advanced node, of course, but that serves a very small percentage of, of the customer base. Uh, we have a lot of customers here that don't need advanced node, but they, they do some very sophisticated things that requires some very sophisticated technology. So we, together, you and I can work to help change the language that there's more to a uh, leading edge <laughs> than just advanced node. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? And it's it's great to educate you know people on this because, and some people might not even know what we're talking about when we say, you know, we're talking about nodes and millimeters and things right. like that. But it is important to understand that some of this technology has been around a long time and it's not really going anywhere. Um, right. Contrary to, to popular belief, you know, that you hear sometimes. And that's a good segue to the next question. I mean, the model has been around, it's been well known. You think of the Foundry model for what, 30 years, would you say? Something like that. Oh, yeah. um, so when you think about overall in the macro, you know, it's it's been a tough macro environment. You know, you think of 2022, 2023, what makes your model at Skywater unique and how will that enable you to achieve strong growth this year and, and kind of beyond when others maybe are struggling a little bit and having some downturn? Yeah, uh, another good and very timely question. I think, you know, one of the things about our industry is people always invest in the downturn preparing for the next up cycle. And there's two types of investment. One is capacity investment. The other is capability investment. And one of the things that I think, you know, clouded the picture was the, we'll call it the COVID snapback. So when, when the supply chain got disrupted, uh, everybody started uh, trying to figure out their own supply chain. And that created a lot of, we'll call it false demand signals all over the place. And I think we're now going through the correction of that, where uh, kind of rebalancing is what is the true supply? What is the real uh, demand? And out of that, of course, we got the chips bill. Uh, there's now a commitment from the U.S. government to help, you know, do smart investment here in the U.S. so that we can never get in this situation again. And the Department of Commerce, Department of Defense have been doing a great job of really uh, laying the groundwork so we can I think come out of this much stronger. Uh, but the thing about Skywater is we do this ATS business, it's advanced technology services. And all of our customers have, if anything, you know, accelerated their development timelines because everybody wants to get prepared for this next upcycle that's coming. And because we're not dependent on just a commoditized product, uh, we're innovating in our fab, 70, 60 to 70% of our revenue now comes from ATS like programs. Think of these as the products of the future that allows us to uh, kind of get a different outcome than, you know, many other semiconductor manufacturers. The other thing to keep in mind is Skywater is an organically grown semiconductor manufacturer in the 2020s here in the U.S. Uh, we're not trying to, like I said, replicate what others have done. So uh, we have kind of an open open water here in terms of how we're bringing this model to market. Uh, we, you know, this last quarter on a you know, 240, $250 million run rate, we're generating 25% profit margins. That's kind of unheard of in our industry for companies our size. And it's because we are what I call a CapEx-like model. And you, you headed earlier, it's technology as a service. We don't go into it saying, we're gonna own all the assets. We're gonna take on all the debt and hope that one of these products really ramps to a volume where we get our payback. We essentially are the operators. Uh, we bring in others investment through the R&D, in many cases, the buying of the equipment itself if we don't have it. And that allows not only a commitment on their side because they're committed to success 
uh, but allows us to run very efficiently. That model, I think, is really going to be the way technologies are brought uh, to market here in the U.S. as this decade unfolds. I think our model early is the future model. So when you think of the cyclicality of semiconductors, there's a lot of overstocking that typically, especially when the supply chain had issues, so people just order as much as they could get. Double, triple, quadruple. Look. Right. But this is an assumption here, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but because you're a little bit more agile, the way you work directly with the companies, I would imagine that you have less of that, right? Less overstocking because you're kind of making it more just in time. And maybe that's not the best way to say it, but is that is that true or is that just a, a bad assumption? So we have um, on our volume business, we have a few, a handful of no large companies and we have relationships with them. So that becomes a predictable part of our business. On the development side, these are new products that in many cases haven't even hit the market yet. So they're very much in the development cycle. So when they go to production, we'll be the sole source manufacturer. Uh, we own all the manufacturing IP. Our customers, of course, want to get them to market quickly. So we have to make sure we have the capacity to get multiple customers to scale uh, at the same time. That's our commitment. But the idea right now is that these development programs are accelerating or moving faster you know, we always talk about in our business velocity, we want things to move fast, right? So the ability to uh, take advantage of that uh, is really the unique differentiator that we have today. Whereas other companies are, are you know, pulling back, you know, orders aren't coming in, they're, they're doing layoffs. Uh, we're doing the exact opposite. The, uh, we're, you know, we're hiring, we have many open recs, we're hiring a lot of great engineers, a lot of great technicians. Uh, one of the benefits when the industry snaps back, it's it's putting a lot of, uh, you know, other resources, um, you know, here in the U.S., making them available, putting them on the table, as we say. Our our unique model, the the partnership with Purdue, what we're doing here in Minnesota, University of Minnesota, in Florida, we have uh, our fab down there that's doing all advanced packaging. Uh, we were the recipient of the uh, Department of Commerce's Build Back Better Regional Challenge, the only uh, semiconductor recipient. So we're scaling down there. That's another a great example of a public-private partnership where the community itself built, invested $130 million to build a fab, uh, to build a STEM school for their essentially, um, you know, students that want to go into high tech. And uh, we're uh, through the regional challenge, Build Back Better regional challenge, we're actually completely facilitating the clean room, bringing in a lot of equipment. And this is all very advanced heterogeneous integration, advanced packaging technology that today you can only get in Asia. So that's that was the next thing I was going to ask you about, the Florida Fab Investment. And you kind of just um, talked about that. And I was going to talk then about uh, Silicon Heartland. Yeah. You, you just mentioned it, University of Minnesota, which I wasn't aware of, and then uh, Purdue. Can you go into a little bit more detail there? So I know you've done some speaking at, at a couple mm -hmm. of different universities. So essentially what we're doing is we're trying to, we're, we're trying, we have programs now, uh, if you want to go to school to learn about this. And we're trying to, to get people that are U.S., you know, in the U.S. to learn about it and to stay on our shore and work at these foundries as we invest in them. Yep. So tell us a little bit more about that. What does that look like? What kind of investment, what kind of partnership relationship do you have with those universities? Yeah, so, the, so every one of our sites, both current and future, we want associated with a major university. So in Florida, it's University of Central Florida. Okay. Um, we're also partnering with the University of Florida. And then we have a community college ecosystem, Valencia College, uh, that then work with the STEM schools at the you know high school level, and you build an entire workforce development uh, capability, kind of you know K through you know K through twenty uh, you know kind of things where uh, you're you're building the entire pipeline of talent, and then that's the workforce development piece. And then by doing that and tying it to university, you by definition get the synergistic innovation, because where does a lot of innovation happen? It happens at universities, and not just one university. All universities typically partner with other universities, and that really you know becomes the the other element. And then um, when you look at uh, the secure manufacturing piece, that that's what makes the investment valid? Chips requires that innovation dollars that become manufactured products, you know, all get sourced in the U.S. And so, part of the idea is you tie it to university, you tie it to an embedded innovation capability. That's our ATS model and secure manufacturing. That's our wafer services business. And in uh, Purdue, they're doing something really exciting. So Purdue, uh, they 
um, have very similar model, very strong uh, K through 12 you know, programs, West Lafayette uh, High School, one of the best in the state. Uh, they, they have Ivy College, which is their, you know, essentially community college feeder system, along with a few other colleges. And then they have, of course, Purdue. Purdue is committed to what's called the Semiconductor Degrees Program. And that's a specific curriculum for semiconductor uh, technology. Uh, it just kicked off this year. Meng Chang, who was the Dean of Engineering, is now the president of Purdue. Great partner, along with Eric Holcomb, the governor of Purdue, and Mitch Daniels, uh, that, that whole community came together with this idea that we're going to build a fab essentially on campus. And that's what uh, the Purdue fab is all about. And again, it has all the elements. It has the workforce development, it has the synergistic innovation, and it has the secure manufacturing. The last thing I'll add is they have what they call the SCALE program. The SCALE program is for individuals that are at the student level that want to get security clearances. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we do, again, you know, ties to national security, it becomes classified work, and this is a mechanism for students, you know, as they're preparing to get degrees to get exposed to that. And there, there's actually programs uh, that uh, Purdue has been awarded uh, to bring this kind of capability and fan it out, not just to Purdue, but many other universities. And that's yes. something that's important for us because security is utmost um, you know, important. That's that's awesome. I, I have an eight year old daughter and she's obsessed with STEM, uh, real, oh, real really into science. And at breakfast this morning, I've been teaching her about uh, robotics. She's been really into robotics and oh. I'm telling her about semiconductors. And I think my tune now, intelligent <laughs> automation. <laughs> right. That's uh, the fabulous future. And I told her, you know, she was born in a diner real close to where you're sitting oh, yeah. here. And I told her I was I was uh, going to interview a CEO that works for a semiconductor company. And so I had to explain semiconductors a little bit more. And it's funny. She said at breakfast, she said, I, I asked Alexa last night what her favorite chip was. And she said a computer chip because that's the only thing she could eat. <laughs> so, it's good. There you go. So Alexis. She runs on them, though. Of course, it would be yeah. her favorite chip, right? <laughs> exactly. So it's yeah, just pretty cool seeing uh, my daughter really into that. And, you know, oh, I tell yeah. her, like, that's the opportunity. You know, if you want to get into that, there's lots of opportunity out there. So for sure. Yeah, we, we actually have uh, internships that we do with the STEM school. We do it here in Minnesota. And, uh, you know, Purdue actually has uh, a program. Uh, I'll get the acronym wrong, but they have a program to embed uh, interns as well in, at major fabs. Uh, and it's tied to the semiconductor degrees program. And what, what, you're, what you see happening is, it goes back to what I said, making semiconductor manufacturing cool again, right? You get people exposed at a very young age uh, to manufacturing and they get excited about it. And the thing is, we're doing atomic level manufacturing. So it's not like we're making widgets, right? We're, we're doing things, in many cases, making things that have never been done before. Uh, having the ability to uh, you know, get exposed to that, the, the stuff that we get out of the STEM school in Florida is just amazing. They, they're, they're solving problems that uh, you wouldn't imagine 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds being able to solve. And they're, they're, they're in many ways, more creative. They don't have blockers uh, right, that right. adulthood kind of put on you. And uh, it's just exciting. The, uh, the, the, this idea of letting the community help create the capability. And I think, you know, you mentioned Silicon Heartland. That's really the idea of bringing, you know, not just, you know, handing out subsidies to big companies or, you know, foreign companies to be blunt. It's all about building something that this country can really leverage for decades to come. And that's a, you know, a workforce committed to manufacturing. I mean, manufacturing, great countries manufacture things. And we yeah, kind of yeah. forgot about that for a while, but I think we, we appreciate it now. And doing it with high tech, doing it in the Midwest where you have, you know, a lot of community, uh, great, you know, cost of living advantages, many of the things that, uh, that I think are untapped, frankly, certainly in the high tech space. And being able to have it linked to all the great universities we have in the Midwest, of course, we have Florida as well. There, I, I, I kind of look at it as, as places that traditionally don't have semiconductor or high tech. You know, that's been kind of confined to the coast, the Southwest, and now there's this, you know, kind of the rest of America uh, that is very excited to kind of tap into this. And it's yeah. it is the uh, it's the future, and I think everybody should be part of it. And that's the other thing about chips is it, it's allowing that to happen. It's exciting because when I was eight, I was I think I was blowing up GI Joes with firecrackers, and, and my daughter's you know into robotics and watching videos about robotics. I know, right? yeah, that's and building her. things, right? Yeah, yeah good. so that's good. We got we need we want a productive future, right? So, oh yeah, that's right. 
I was going to ask about Google, but you kind of went into it and I have a few other questions. I, I, let's kind of go in the, from an investment perspective. So someone watching this, they want to learn about your company and maybe they haven't invested. They want to learn why it could be a potentially good investment. And of course, anytime we talk about numbers, there are just projections. There's no guarantees in anything, right. especially in the stock market. But with, when you look at your long-term revenue projection, it's anticipated to be a billion dollars in revenue in 2030, according to the last earnings call. Now, if I did my numbers correctly, I think, yeah, you know, Skywater was a little under $200 million in revenue in 2022. So this represents about a 500% growth, possibly no guarantees over the next seven years. Can you share your thoughts on how you could achieve this goal? Yeah. So we actually did 213 this past year. So 213 million. So just over two. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the, the path is relatively, we call it our long-term model. So it's 25% top line growth, and then basically a pathway to 40% plus gross margins. And so if you just you know do the math, uh, you can see, and we, we can maintain the pace that there is a way to uh, you know create a, a billion dollar company by the end of the decade. And more importantly, a billion dollar company that one isn't vastly in debt, uh, because we're having to go spend our own money to build things. Uh, and also one that enjoys 40% plus profit margins. And the reason we can do that is because of the, the way this model works. And the thing that is happening, you can see it today with our most recent results, is the semiconductor manufacturing business is a high fixed cost business. And typically, when you finally absorb that fixed cost, the way you make more you know, dollars is by making more of something that's already paid for, right? So making more wafers. What we do at Skywater is we do that, but then we also have this ATS business where we're not selling wafers, we're selling activities. Uh, activity, think of that as every time you touch a wafer. And these are all the experimental programs that we're doing. So it's very complex to run R&D in a high volume manufacturing environment. That's literally our secret sauce is we have figured out how to do that, how to make you know the volume customers get what they want but also the r d customers get what they want and we do it all in the same fab so we use intelligent automation we use a lot of very sophisticated capabilities to manage the complexity but by doing that you now have the ability to have a high nre business you know uh, we always talk about an excess of 50 percent gross margins on our ats business coupled with more of a break-even way for services business today and you combine that together and that's where you start to get the margins that we're delivering now now what's going to happen over time is you're going to these programs that are in ats they're not science fair projects they're all targeted towards production right and as they go to production the concentration of the legacy customer primarily today is infinium technology infinium bought cypress so that's you know technologies that have been running this fab for 15 plus years as they, those become uh, less and less from the overall uh, so they become a smaller part of the overall revenue concentration you're going to have a lot more high margin products in the wafer services side complemented by these already high margins on the ats side so we like to say that and once we got and this really happened last year we demonstrated once you got above 45 million 45 to 50 million that's a fixed cost of the business 50 percent of every incremental dollar was flowing through through to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So what's really unique about our model is one is we're asset light. So we don't buy a lot of the CapEx uh, that, that we use to create capabilities for our customers, but we also don't have to just use it for that customer. We get to use it for many customers. So uh, we don't offer exclusivity, uh, obviously, except for a couple of DOD situations. The other thing we can do is we can uh, grow and scale these R&D programs, essentially that are funded by our customers as opposed to us, and that becomes our pipeline of future capability going forward. All single source products that are made at Skywater, and if they have to be moved from Skywater, then we will own the manufacturing IP. So even if they moved it, we still get a royalty or something like that. That's why I said when we talked at, at the onset, kind of like an ETF for semiconductors, because you know our platforms is we have a CMOS platform, we have a RAD hard platform, uh, we have a photonics platform, we have a superconducting technology a platform, uh, we have uh, various MIMS type solutions, we have heterogeneous integration advanced packaging, and we have an emerging carbon nanotube platform that is really exciting uh, that came out of a DARPA program. Uh, this is actually the program that uh, last quarter we uh, announced that we had a one-time, you know, kind of program closure uh, flow through that 4.5 million. That was tied to our original DARPA program with MIT and Sanford to use carbon nanotubes to uh, 
uh, essentially e extend the capability. So we talked about advanced nodes. In this case, this is a taking a 90 nanometer technology and make it run at sub 20, I mean, sub 10 nanometer uh, levels by using carbon nanotubes and, and you know, to complement traditional CMOS processing. Resistive RAM as well, which is a great emerging technology. Okay. All, all that is 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 a lot, <laughs> but it's it's uh, all about doing things differently and bringing a lot of new capabilities to market uh, across the bio, advanced computing, industrial, automotive, and A and D spaces. And you kind of went into the next couple of questions, but specifically in the earnings call, there was a comment about how all your hard work is going to kind of really come together in 2025. And I think you probably alluded to it in that answer, but just to pinpoint on that, you know, why is that? Why is 2020, 2025 kind of that magic year where things really will start to come together for you? Yeah. So, you know, this year uh, we have a lot of DOD programs that are ramping up. That's one of the things that insulates us from some of the other macro effects. Uh, we're, we're ramping DOD programs that are, you know, funded and kind of all about execution. As long as we execute, the uh, the commitment is there. We also have a lot of commercial programs that are in ATS this year that we expect to go to volume production next year. Uh, this is in the biomed space, the photonic space, uh, applications that uh, are very ex exciting and in, in many cases disruptive. We like disruptive applications. The uh, 20, so think of this as the year of a lot of DOD focus, 24. Uh, we not only have our new products coming on the commercial side, but also we have some of the original purchase depreciation coming off. Uh, so there's seven years when you acquire a business. So, so that will also roll off. Uh, next year. And then as we exit 24 and go to 25, the rad hard technology we talked about will actually go into production. And, and so these are very valuable wafers. All the investment in rad hard today is standing up a capability uh, that the DOD was investing in because they wanted to have this new strategic rad hard uh, fab, you know, fabrication uh, offering. And all the primes will now be designing products on those plan is for those products to go into systems starting in 2025. And then we have a, a seven year with a three year extension. So between seven and 10 year commitment to make those products. And so when you get a, into 2025, you now have some additional high margin uh, products flowing through. We haven't talked about ROICs, which are readout ICs. These are also made on CMOS platforms. Think of these as optics for night vision goggles, the optics um, on an F-35. These are all capabilities that we're also doing. Not strategic rad hard, but um, things that, again, have to work in space and extreme environments and areas that we can then couple like microbolometers, which is a MIMS, MIMS device that does thermal uncold infrared imaging. And you combine that uh, through the wafer level vacuum packaging. So one of the things that I think is a real opportunity for the U.S. is to leverage advanced packaging heterogeneous integration is a way to really drive the future. What you're going to see happening, everybody's been talking about dimensional shrinkage for the last 30 years, right? Moore's Law, etc. Well, that's pretty much done now. We're, we're going to pretty much know how to make everything and it's going to be now to how do I combine all that stuff together through what I call the Lego strategy, allows you to mix and match these technologies using, you know, wafer fan out packaging, hybrid bonding, interposer technology. Uh, that's really what's going to be the big wave of the future. Yeah, no, that makes sense because there's a couple questions I had and you answered them. And really, I want to kind of tie it together for the, the viewer. You know, where I was going with this is that you have that uh, strategic partnership with a large customer, Infineon. And, you know, a lot of times people will look at it and say, well, it's a concentration. And I wanted to kind of paint that picture for the viewers that as an investor, you want to understand the direction of the company, how you're going to grow into different segments and also lower that exposure, you know, to some of the larger clients. And you just explained how you're going to yep. do that. On the earnings call, you talked about really three product areas and you mentioned those, you you know, biomedical, you know, photonics, and, you know, this stuff gets into a lot of those secular growth trends that we talked about earlier. I'll probably Absolutely. put an image up on the screen that's from your your website that shows all the different areas I got off of your uh, blog or whatever, just so people can see that Perfect. as well. We talked about automotive already. You know, I think the key here is right now, automotive, industrial, aerospace, and defense seem like the primary segments in biomedical. Um, and I think it's important just to, to stress with automotive how much total addressable market there really is out there. 
together uh, for potential growth over the next decades. We kind of talked about that already. And I want to point out again, you mentioned it, but you're single source. So these technologies are co-created with customers and it leads to better pricing and with time, better margins. And you kind of talked to that as well, but to kind of put it in simple terms. It also, I think, provides deeper relationships because Absolutely. you know, you're know you working with them back and forth. With the old model, it's just like, here you go, here you go, make this. And now it's more like a strategic partnership back and forth, a collaboration, yep. right? Much more um, intimate. Yeah. So more of a trust advisor, uh, deeper relationships, and that's going to help with the margins. You know, 25%, I think now, and you're looking for more 40% or so by the end of 2025, if I did my homework right, is that is that accurate? Yeah. So we, we had talked about, we had that one-time gain. So 20% without that one-time gain. Yeah, and we okay. got it between 15 and 20 uh, for this year. Again, because we do want to have some flexibility to do investment if we need to. And at the same time, we expect to continue, you know, the 25%, you know, close to 25% top line growth. Um, we think 60s, you know, as we said, is the floor uh, going forward. And so we we kind of look at the Q4 run rate going forward. Right. And, um, you know, we have a lot of efficiencies um, that we can continue to extract here. Uh, Florida, again, is just getting started. It, it has, you know, several ATS programs, a lot of it is bringing new technology with partners like IMEC, which is a Belgium-based consortium that they're, they're another example of how, how these models work. But down in Florida, there's an entity called Bridge, which is the public interface with Osceola County that kind of manages the asset. And then IMEC, which is this development consortium, their U.S. operation is there. Uh, Tokyo Electron is there, the biggest J Japanese uh, equipment manufacturer, one of the top three in the world. And then we're there. And so you're bringing this ecosystem, of course, you have the STEM school there as well, uh, Valencia College, literally right down the road. Uh, so you're, you're beginning to build this network, UFC, or UCF, I'm sorry, all, you know, within a call it five mile radius, right? And and that's really where you talk about building these innovation hubs, these technology parks, uh, that, that's really where it's where it's gonna where it's gonna happen. It is really exciting stuff and a great conversation. We could talk for a lot longer. There's two quick yeah. things to kind of wrap up. I want to respect your time. You know, I think it's important for the audience to understand, you know, maybe you as a person, what are you into? What are your hobbies? When you're not working all the time trying to build a business there, and what do you like to do in your spare time, if you have any? <laughs> uh, yeah, play guitar. <laughs> play guitar, okay. Yeah. yeah, I love playing guitar and uh, you know, traveling. I have a 19-year-old son, so that still keeps me pretty busy. And then sports, uh, hockey, football, baseball. Yeah. But, yeah. but just to relieve stress, it's all about playing guitar. I have one here right behind me in my office. <laughs> so acoustic guitar and... No, electric guitar. Electric guitar, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I don't, yeah, if it was acoustic, then that may be a little too loud for outside my office. <laughs> That's true. So I can uh, ping on the electric and no one notices. That's awesome. <laughs> well, a full disclosure for anybody watching, I am an investor uh, in Skywater Technology. You can look the ticker up again. It's SKYT. And I would like to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. And if you'd like to see the 10 best stocks to buy now, visit fool.com forward slash fired up wealth. Tom, I'd like to thank you one more time. Yeah. It's been really great. I, I really enjoyed this conversation more than you know. Not I would love great. to maybe do it again down the road. Sure. And uh, I'll be tracking the company, you know, listening to the earnings calls and, um, you know, sharing sharing as much knowledge as I can and facts and data about your company to anybody who will listen, because I do think it's a great opportunity. You know, when I look at my portfolio, I like small cap semiconductors a lot. Anybody watching knows that. And this is a great play on that foundry side. And uh, right. kind of like you said, ETF, you're so diversified in different areas and really capturing that pick and shovel on those mega trends. And I think there's a lot of great, great opportunity, you know, located in Minnesota. I lived in Minnesota in uh, Eden Prairie for about 18 years. We own, uh, we're part Perfect. owners of a restaurant right down the road from me on France Avenue there, Tavern 23. So yeah, I, I just, I can't thank you enough for your time. It's been a pleasure and have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Be good. Take thank care. You. All right. See ya. Yep. Bye. Bye.